starting in March 1925. We've been doing this a while. We ended COVID or we kicked COVID out so we could do these instead of just waiting around and being isolated. This is how we kept together. In fact, during COVID, we actually grew. We had more members because we were the way to get connected. Hey there. All right, so we have a table, ESCOM table back here. It lists what we do, all the new and good. So swing by when you have a chance. And the, the author will be back with finding books after her presentation. So in addition to our, our authors, Rita Changepi, and in this case, Anna Michelle, they'll be conversing together in a dialogue, which makes it very easy to understand what's going on in the world of writing. First book, her first book. So, I want to, I, there are other people following me. I want to introduce a very special person, Valerie Marquardt, who is of our guide on community education here at the college. We're so lucky to have her uh, as partner, and she works with us tirelessly to keep the relationship between ESCOM and community ed working on the straight and narrow. So please help me welcome Valerie, who will give you a little presentation on what she does. Thank you. A special thank you to Barry for exaggerating um, my ability. But I have had the honor of working with ESCOM for a while. It's been amazing to see this event evolve, continue. Uh, global pandemic, no global pandemic. Here we are again, celebrating authors, bringing people to the for I just want to highlight that Community Ed, you may get our schedule in the mail, and you'll be getting one again for summer 2024. It's coming out at the end of the month and registration begins. We pride ourselves on bringing new fun classes. So this time you can look at uh, ukulele workshops, um, fitness swim, um, ukulele intro to backpacking, all of these new fun classes. If you ever think of a class you would like to offer, or you know someone that would like to teach, or you would like to teach, come to us and let us know. I, I want to introduce of the great of this event, that would be library. Library, honored to have a wonderful librarian who inspires students and staff and faculty. David Pat. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm going to sit down so I can use the microphone. Thank you so much, Valerie. And thank you, Gary. And thanks for everyone to come out on such a beautiful spring day. Um, we're so grateful to ESCOM, who have been our partners in this for, gosh, I want to say eight or nine years, and very grateful to um, Community Education, which Valerie works with, um, and Book Passage. Can everyone wave at Zach back there? If Book Passage, in my opinion, I'm biased, is the best bookstore in the world. And Zach is the best bookseller in the world. So if you want to buy a copy of um, Rita's book or Hannah's book, he would be glad to sell them to you. Thanks to the IT department, too, and to Harvey for uh, getting this on YouTube and on um, Zoom. Um, and welcome to our guests online. When we open up for questions and answers, if you're on Zoom, please put your questions for our authors in the chat. And then if you'd like to join us a month from now, we're going to have Brian Copeland here, uh, who's just written his first uh, novel. It's a, a crime thriller. I read chapter one and I'm hooked. So it's going to be Friday, June 17th here in this room, um, same time. Of course, our greatest gratitude is to our two amazing authors for writing your beautiful books and sharing them with us today. Hannah Michelle. Hannah Michelle grew up in Seoul. She studied anthropology and philosophy at Cambridge University 
And now she lives here in the Bay Area with her husband and children. She teaches in the Asian American and Asian Diaspora Studies program at UC Berkeley. Um, Excavations, great book. I'm a third of the way through it and I highly recommend it, uh, is her American debut. And um, Rita Chang Epig is, um, she received her master's degree in fine arts in fiction from New York University. Her novel, um, uh, Deep as the Sky, Red as the Sea, was a Barnes and Noble Discover book, an Indie Next book, an Indies Introduce book, and a Good Morning American Buzz pick. And I give it my hearty endorsement. I'm this close to finishing it, and I just love it. So I hope you'll all read her book. Um, Rita's stories have appeared in The Best American Short Stories of 2021, McSweeney's Quarterly Concern, and many other places. And um, I just learned this this morning. As you'd expect in a novel about a pirate queen, <laughs> there are some really great fight scenes. And um, I discovered this morning, I was watching a YouTube video of Rita doing another interview, and she, Rita has a background in karate. And so she consulted some of her former karate instructions instructors about the fight scenes in the novel. So no wonder they're so good. She, she went to experts. Will you please join me in welcoming Hannah Michelle and Rita Chang Epig? Yeah, thank you, Dave, for that wonderful introduction. I just want to make sure oh, everyone can hear me because I tend to be a soft speaker. Um, thank you for having us here today. I'm uh, actually really, I, I was really happy and excited when um, the College of Marin and Book Passage approached me about this because um, uh, sometimes, you know, your book comes out and then there is all of this buzz for like a month or two afterwards. And then sometimes it feels a little bit like people have forgotten you. And so we were both really excited because both our books came out last year to have um, another opportunity to talk to folks about, you know, the process that went into writing, you know, the processes that went into writing these books and, uh, and uh, you know, to introduce people to these worlds. Um, and I was also especially excited to have um, that Hannah agreed to do this event with me because um, I had actually met Hannah at a book event prior before I read your novel. And then we, you know, um, we exchanged novels so that we could read each other's work. And then after I read it, I was like, oh, there are actually all of these really amazing, um, uh, sort of, uh, there's a really ama amazing convergence of ideas. There are many kind of um, parallel themes in both of our books. And so I thought um, she would be a great person to do this event with. So thank you, Hannah, for agreeing to do this with me. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. I um, I feel like, as I was telling you earlier, I found a literary kindred spirit in in reading your work. Um, I do feel like our work is conversant with each other. So um, I've been very excited about. Yeah. Um, and actually, if it's okay with everybody, um, because I, I always feel a little bit awkward when like, you know, too much is, uh, attention is on me. We're actually gonna be doing kind of a joint interview where I'm going to be asking Hannah some questions and Anna's gonna be asking me some questions so that it feels more equitable. I hope that's okay with, with everyone. I, I assume it's gonna be okay. Yeah, yeah. It's it, just a little bit close. Okay, sure. So um, yeah, we're, we're gonna be doing, we're gonna be asking each other questions because it feels more equitable um, that way. And also just because Hannah's book is really, really great. Like it's, um, it, I would describe it as like part crime novel and part family drama. And it's just, um, I, I didn't know that it was what I was looking for until I read it. So that's that's the endorsement that I'm gonna make for it. Um, that is such high praise um, from, I mean, your book amaz is so amazing. I don't know if anyone in this room has read it yet, but it's just like 
so rich in history, um, but also really propulsive. And the driver of the plot is this really complex, powerful, you know, and uh, intriguing character. So, um, I yeah, it was totally enthralled. Let's talk a little bit about uh, strong female characters, mm -hmm. shall we? Yeah. 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 So um, at the center of um, Hannah's no uh, novel, we've got several strong um, women characters. But I, the, the one who's sort of at the forefront is um, Say. Is, am I pronouncing that yes, correctly? Right. Um, who is a, an investigative journalist or former investigative journalist at the start of the novel. And one day, her husband disappears in um, uh, possibly connected to a, uh, a building collapse that happens in Seoul. And so the rest of the book is her trying to piece together, to excavate, if you will, uh, the, um, the events of that day and what led to her husband's disappearance. So we've got a very strong woman character there, but she's also a mother. You know, she's also a daughter. She she play, wears many hats and plays many roles. Um, and uh, yeah, and did, did you want to just say a little bit about kind of how you, and there, there's this one character who is a madam who basically works, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, um, but uh, she's also a very complex and uh, agentic character. So did you want to say a little bit more about kind of what led to that? And yeah. Um, so actually, the origin story of this book is that I originally conceived of it as a conversation between two men, uh, the chairman character, who's a third narrative strand in the book, and uh, and a male journalist. Um, and um, I just couldn't write it. The work was not happening. Um, I had just had my second child, and um, I was trying to get into the head of this chairman character and I was starting to get really resentful. I was like, here is this high achieving chairman who never had to breastfeed or, you know, worry about like how much time he had on the clock before getting home to feed the children. Um, and so then it quickly became, well, you know, what would happen if the, the journalist was a working mother? And so I started really mining the tensions in my own lived reality um, and tried to write that. So that that became the Say character. Uh, so I was drawing partially on, on my experience um, as a working mom. Um, and um, and the Myung Hee character, I honestly am not quite sure where she came from other than uh, the fact that the book originally just only centered this chairman character's uh, achievements which are written into history, but uh, women's uh, contributions to the economy uh, are rarely talked about. Um, and um, and after the end of the Korean War, uh, South Korea was actually the second poorest country in the world and had no resources. And, um, and as a result, uh, the only way to build up the economy was just by selling anything that was available, including human hair that was then woven into textiles and exported. Um, and uh, sex work was also encouraged uh, with military personnel to bring in US dollars. But, you know, those are the aspects of history, economic history that aren't kind of as visible as the more triumphant uh, stories of the economic miracle. So that, that was partially where she emerged from. Yeah, I mean, I think there's something about um, the histories of women, right? Like the histories of women tend to get erased um, by the official documents. Um, one of the reasons why I wanted to write this particular book is because I noticed that very often when people talk, so to give a little bit of a synopsis, it's based on the, it's loosely, it's a fictional telling of the life of this, quote, pirate queen who lived in Southern China in the early 1800s. And um, this was, uh, you, you know, when, when you look at the official historical documents, many of the accomplishments of the, uh, or exploits, depending on who you ask, of this particular pirate fleet were attributed to the men in the fleet. So it was first attributed to 
um, her first, this uh, Sek Young's first husband, and then after her first husband died, um, the exploits of the fleet were attributed to her second husband. And I think that's something that we're both very interested in as authors, which is what are the kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, neglected or hidden away histories that um, official documents don't like to talk about, right? In this case, um, it was a woman who, um, by many historians, historians' estimates, um, this was the most, the largest and most successful pirate fleet in um, Asian and some say world history. So she was commanding at the peak of her power, something like 20, 30,000 men, right? And yet in historical documents, it's like, oh, her husband's did all of these things, even though in oral, in oral, um, you know, history, she played a massive role in all of these things. And so I think that is something we share about, an interest we share about um, these uh, tucked away histories. Actually, so I, I'm curious to know about your research process if, you know, since uh, these stories are less visible, uh, these histories are less visible, um, how, how did you conduct your research and what did you do? I'm, I'm curious also um, because um, Sek Young is also a mother mm -hmm. um, and I suddenly got to a point where I was wondering, you know, her motherhood experiences, like were those documented historically? Um, yeah, so tell us a bit about that. Yeah, I think there are, so as you might imagine, um, there are many points that I had to, many places where I just had to fill it in with my imagination just because there is no, there's no record of what actually happened. Um, in fact, I mean, this is a story I like to tell, but I, I'm gonna repeat it here just because I think it's so, um, it's so telling. Um, the most common name that we use for Sekyung in um, East Asia is uh, Zeng Yi Sal, which literally translates to Zeng Yi's wife. Mm -hmm. And so, so she's she, she's not she's nameless in a way. It, I mean, we have her name, but when people refer to her, she might as well be nameless. And so, I, I think that gives you an idea of what what it was like to try to um, piece together her history, right? They, like, I think we have, we have the larger events, um, like, you know, we, history documents things like naval battles. It documents things like who was the commander, who won what, you know, what naval um, uh, skirmish. Um, it, uh, history documents, you know, who ceded power to whom. But um, a lot of the, a lot of this, you know, that's just the skeleton, right? Like we need to kind of fill historical fiction in with other things like relationships and values and what, what these people loved and what these people believed and, you know, what who these people pray to. And so filling in those other parts of the body, I think, is the role of the of the fiction writer versus the role of the, the historian. And so um, the the larger facts like this battle happened here. Those are true to history. What, what I have in the book are true to history is true to history. But um, the things like, you know, like what were her friendships like? And yeah, what was it like for her to be a mother? I, I, I have no idea what it was like to be. We know that she was a mother because she is documented to have had children, but we don't actually know anything about what the lived experience of motherhood was like for her. And so a lot of those, I just had to do the best I could with my imagination. Yeah. yeah I think uh, some of my favorite parts are um, the points of tension where uh, she's, well, I don't want to give it away, but anyway, she's what, sort of wondering, you know, how she can be a leader and, um, and be, you know, pregnant um, at the same time. And, you know, that's such a real tension in, in the present day also. So um, I love that. Yeah, and, and I would say not even, not so much what whether she can be a leader and be pregnant at the same time, but whether the people around her believe that she can be pregnant and a leader at the same time. You know, I think many women world leaders past and present, they're like, no, I can do this job, yeah. pregnant or not, right? But it's the, it's the people around them that say, well, maybe you should 
mm. maybe you should stop and focus on uh, focus on um, what what we think you should be doing. So. Yeah, um, I, I am curious. I wanted to ask you a little bit too about the research that you did because excavations, the tower collapse that leads to the disappearance of the husband, um, that happens in, I want to say, the early 90s, right? The like, yeah. Um, but your novel actually spans quite a number of decades because we get, we get a flash forward, for lack of a better word, um, to the 2000s. What we, we get stuff happening in the 2000s. And then we also have these really um, interesting and unexpected chapters about earlier in Korean um, history, uh, such as the Japanese occupation and the, and the, is it called the civil, what do you call it there, the Korean Civil War, the Korean? Uh, it's the Korean War. Korean War, yeah. And I am curious what it was like for you to have to do research and juggle all of these different time periods at once? Because I just had to focus on the one thing, you know, like right. you, you, you were standing down. Um, So I think to answer that question, I have to share the backstory of, of the, the, or the origin story of, the, of this book, which is that I had this really lofty intellectual idea uh, that I was going to write the story of the Korean economy as personified by this chairman character. Um, note to self, never do this again. Um, <laughs> um, so actually, you know, now in, in this final uh, iteration uh, of the novel, there are um, narratives that challenge the, the chairman's perspective, which is told in the first person. But originally my first draft was uh, just this chairman telling his story from his boyhood during the Japanese colonial era, and then through to, I, I actually hadn't figured out the end point. Um, and so it, had, it was told in this kind of chronological way, uh, but then once I realized uh, that his story was going to be um, interrupted um, by a, several other perspectives, then, um, then the time structure of the novel became scrambled. Um, so I, it was chronologically chronological originally, and then it it sort of evolved. And um, I would say my research process was incredibly messy. Um, I read a lot of um, memoirs written by chairmen, uh, chairmen of big companies, um, and um, also biographies. And I was always struck by how um, kind of celebratory and heroic um, these, you know, um, they were portrayed in this really heroic way. Um, and then, you know, I would find sort of uh, counter narratives in social histories um, where you um, learn that under the dictatorship, there was a lot of exploitation. Um, you know, there was a lot of civil and labor unrest. Um, as a result, um, so so I I don't think that it was like a, an organized process. Uh, you know, I just uh, my research um, was driven by where I wanted to go in the story, and then I was like, oh, I think I need to know about this, and it, it was really hairy for a while. <laughs> um, I've I've heard this said before, and I I don't. I don't know who um, to whom to attribute this. So if you're for some reason watching this, I'm sorry that I'm not um, attributing you properly. But um, I once heard a um, a really uh, a, a talented author say that there are two types of authors. There are authors who love doing research mm -hmm. and there are authors who like do the bare minimum of research necessary in order to get them. A couple so would you would you consider yourself like the former or the latter? I, I think I'm neither. Maybe. I don't... Um, I felt really compelled. And in fact, I would have panic attacks, uh, you know, and like, you know, where I couldn't sleep because I was like, I'm writing the story about the Korean economy. I don't feel like I know the history well enough. I need more research. And um, my parents are um, um, academics and my mom would always read my work and be like, well, I don't think a person of this gender and social class would behave in this way. And so I had this imaginary academic historian kind of, you know, finger pointing at me as I was uh, writing. But 
I think I did enough research to feel like I knew what I was talking about, but there was also a point of letting go for me where um, I was like, I am also trying to tell a story about an emotional truth um, and make a, a, a point, a thematic point about how corruption and uh, buried history. So, um, and in fact, um, Korean libel laws mean, have meant that I had to very much fictionalize uh, the chairman character. So, um, so yeah. Wait, do those libel laws apply to people who are? So one of the one of the fun things about writing this book is that American libel laws. I don't know if you all know this. If the person is dead, they can't sue you. This is true. Um, and so, um, and and not only is this a, this person long dead. Um, yeah. This uh, this is um, you know like in a different country. So I I, I felt pretty safe. Yeah. From, from <laughs> Note to self, you know, go further back in history. It's far back enough. You can't, they can't claim. No. Um, but, but yeah, I, I think it's, um, I think I fall very much into the category of people who love mm -hmm. doing research. Like, I think it got to the point where I had to say to myself, okay, researching is not writing. You know what I mean? Like you can, you can come up with a million excuses for, you know, like, well, I just, I need to read one more book about this. I need to go to one more museum exhibit about this. And at a certain point, that's not a book, right? A book is the thing that you like sat down for years on end, you know, to write. So um, I, and I think it doesn't help. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I suspect that maybe doing research on like the Korean economy is less um, fun for lack of a better word than researching pirates. Um, <laughs> like, like, agreed. <laughs> like, if you all could see my search, my internet search history from the couple of years I was doing research for this book, like if somebody looked at my search history, they would be like, who is this eight-year-old who is obsessed with pirates? Because everything is about like, what kind of weapons did pirates yeah. use? What kind of food did pirates eat? What kind of, what kind of ships did pirates eat? And they would be like, oh, this eight-year-old was really interested in pirates. Um, <laughs> so um but yeah so so i think i because the the stuff was just so fascinating i think there's there was like the child like part of myself that kind of wishes i could have been a pirate um and so yeah like i i think a, a lot of my time was spent doing both on the ground research like um i'm i'm very fortunate to be uh uh a Taiwanese citizen as well. And so like during um, during the research process, I was able to go back and they have a lot of, like they have a, a f um, full-sized replica of an actual junk ship, which so like this little kind of ship, mm. uh, they have a full-sized replica like in Taiwan that you can get on and you can like hug the masts and like kind of get a sense of what kind of scale we're talking about. And so, yeah, when, when you have stuff like that, you don't want to sit down and write the book. You want to just keep doing that stuff. So um, I think, it, so I don't know if anybody here is a writer or working on fiction, but just a, a word of advice. Like I, I know the research can really suck you in, but at some point you, you need to kind of just set a deadline for yourself and do the, and do the actual thing. I mean, I don't know. What, um, what, what I, like I'm, I find so impressive is that you, I mean, it's clear that you've done an extraordinary amount of, of, research and there's so much vivid detail um, in the book, but it never feels like there's just like pages and pages of like dense exposition. Um, and um, it feels very organic, the information that you, you, you learn, you know, it's very much um, embodied. Um, you know, for example, there's this one moment where um, the ship is coming into Canton and um, uh, Sekyung sees the the beheaded heads on on poles um, as a warning to pirates who are coming back to to shore, and um, you know I think that's a, an amazing historical detail, but it doesn't feel like out of place because that's the kind of thing as a character you would notice. You know that's the kind of thing she would take in and respond to. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk more about that, like you know about. Uh, honing in on um, on details and making it feel like, I think when we spoke earlier, you um, you said you wanted 
uh, historical details to be embodied and contextualized um, and not, you know, just like here, I'm going to educate you on on this period. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm because if people wanted to read a bunch of facts about the period, they they have history books for that, right? Like that, I, I, that's not really my domain. And so I think one question that I kept asking myself as I was writing was, is this, so this story is told from Sekyang's perspective, right? And in a way it's easier when you're doing, um, when you're writing a, pers a, a, a very tight POV where you're very much in a character's head versus an omniscient narrator who can see everything because the omniscient narrator sees everything. The close third POV will only notice the things that the character would notice. So basically, if I didn't feel like Sekyang, the character, would notice a particular detail, I wouldn't include it. You know, it's kind of like, um, so it, in a way, it makes it easier when you're writing outside of an omniscient narrative because you're just restricted to what that person would actually notice at that moment um, in time. I don't know if that answers your question. Yes, it does, yeah. Um, I There's also an interesting sort of, not conversation, um, but resonance in our work around uh, sex work. Mm -hmm. um, and um, there was this quote that I absolutely loved. So, but e despite uh, both of sets of characters being involved in sex work, they are not passive victims. And my favorite, I was just like, yes, when I came to this um, this line that you had written um, where Sekyoung has been uh, captured and then she's sold onto the flower boat and, you know, on her first, you know, evening, somebody tells her, you need to stop having these silly fantasies about being rescued because fantasies lead short lives in places like this. Be smart, watch and listen closely closely and learn when to use the things you hear, you see and hear to your advantage. All you have left now uh, is you. Um, can you tell us more about like that? Um, yeah, what what you were trying to do there? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I imagine there's plenty that you would want to say about that as well. But uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, um, I, I think that it's very often an underappreciated part of history that these places of sex work were often um, places where a lot of informational information brokering happened. You know, it's these were these were places where powerful, rich men tended to gather. Um, and you know, you get a few drinks into people, people start talking, you know, like this, you know, and and you know, part of it is that um you know, these women were often perceived as like furniture, you know, they were like objects, they were furniture. They were, and so the men, say, especially drunk men, say these, say, give away secrets, you know, in the presence of these, of these sex workers. And so um, that, that it, the historical figure of Sekyang, that is actually how she rose to, to power. So she was working in one of, she was actually, uh, there are some accounts that say that she was sex trafficked, right? So she wasn't there voluntarily, mm -hmm. um, but she um, she learned that if she kept her ears open, she could learn a lot of really useful information about the maritime world in China at the time. And um, that is what eventually drew the attention of her first husband, the the pirate commander that she ended up marrying. And so... Yeah, I mean, I, you, you too have a character who is a, um, and the phrase you use in the book is room salon. So I think you might have to give a little bit of a definition of what that is. But you have this madam who's kind of also very um, cunning. And, and, you know, like she's not, she's not there because like everything in her life has gone wonderfully, but like she is choosing to do the best with what she's, she's choosing to, um, I don't know, play the card she's been dealt, I guess yeah. is, is how I would say it. So do you, yeah. you mind saying a little bit? I mean, I, I think I just was very interested in the way that patriarchy can lull us into thinking that women in sex work are just like passive objects with no agency. And um, so room salons are like these karaoke rooms, It also known as like hostess bars. And they're like 
you know, um, women will be, you know, hired to just serve drinks and, you know, entertain. And I think it's like, uh, has some like historical relation with the concept of the geisha as like women as entertainers, but then, you know, it could later in the evening uh, evolve into to sex work. Um, and uh, in the context of my story, I was like, you know, and so much um, of business as, as you were, as in your book, um, is conducted um, in these kind of after work bonding male rituals. Um, and I thought, well, gosh, you know, anyone who's really paying attention to these exchanges could make a ton of money on the stock market at the very least, you, you know? <laughs> Um, and so I thought, well, what if we had, I thought if it felt important to me to have somebody who was really paying attention and utilizing um, her situation in, in this way. And also in a way, what I was trying to do is, you know, the chairman likes to tell his life and work story as a rags to riches one. Um, and I sort of wanted to mirror uh that in in Myung Hee's story in the way that she, you know, both the chairman and Myung Hee have similar strategies of like, you know, just using whatever information they're exposed to to get to the next kind of level or to the, the next position of advantage. Um, so I, I that was something I wanted to explore in, in the play. I mean, we. I think we could talk a lot about the chairman, and but um, I just will say I I am an absolute fan of the first person sections that are um, interspersed throughout the book in the chairman's perspective, mm -hmm. because he is. You've somehow managed to make him both kind of sympathetic, kind mm -hmm. of, but also just incredibly like oily and like. Do you know what I mean? Like like one of those people where you're like, oh, I I don't think I can believe like seventy five percent of the things that you're saying. So like, well done, well done with that. He was he was a creepy character. Um, yeah, I uh, the chairman, his voice and um his kind of that oily nature was really inspired by this memoir written by um. I won't say what company, but um, <laughs> written by the chairman of, of this company. And it really, when I was reading it, I was like, wow, this is an amazing story. He was, he worked so hard. He was so disciplined and he built this company from scratch. And, um, you know, I think there are a lot of, we, we live, you know, in the land of big tech. I think there's like a lot of visionary kind of economic leaders who often tell these like, um, you know, be disciplined, uh, you know, these stories of, um personal qualities that will get you ahead and be successful. But then what, so this was told in the, the first person. And then I, you know, Googled uh, this company because it was a big company when I was a child. And um, the um, chairman ha was arrested for embezzlement uh, and fraud. And I was like, oh, so there's actually a lot that is not, um, that is so omitted uh, in this first person uh, narrative. And so um, that's also informed then um, that theme of what is not written or visible in history. Um, you know, people talk, economists like to talk about the, the economic miracle of South Korea going from being the second poorest country in the world in 19, uh, sorry, 1951 to now the 10th largest com uh, economy in the world. Um, but they don't People don't often talk about the exploitation um, of workers um, under dictatorship um, and um, the lack of kind of uh, democratic strategies that were that also contributed to the success. So, um, yeah. So I, but I really wanted the chairman to be very likable at first. Um, so, um, yeah. But you, you didn't trust him. <laughs> I'm always a little bit hesitant when I see somebody try, like he he has this voice that's very much like, believe me, believe me. And I think the more somebody says, believe me, I'm like, I don't know, should I believe you? Yes. Um, but I, I did want to ask you a question because I, I know I have strong feelings about this and I'm curious where you land on this. Mm. To what sense, I mean, because of Korean libel laws, okay, you couldn't base this on a actual person, but you based it off pieces of like people here to what extent do you feel a responsibility to the characters that you're writing that are based on 
real people because I know that I had to, I grappled with this a lot. Mm. What I'm trying to make, like to what responsibility? Uh, what responsibility do I have to a person who is dead but actually existed and you know had to make her way through the world? So. Yeah. I mean, I think I, I am approaching that question from a slightly different position because in the end, this charming character is very much a mixture of different um, different um, real historical figures. But I think, you know, it's very easy to write a simple villain. Mm -hmm. And so I really did try and think with some empathy, like what drives people who... Um, are just endlessly um, ambitious, you know, and, you know, what, and, and, you know, how, what might their familial um, kind of positions be and, you know, well, what's that motivation? Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. I mean, I think, I guess it is different when you're basing somebody off pieces of mm -hmm. like, like, whereas I think I felt it was a very hard line for me to walk because obviously I wanted to make this an entertaining book, right? Like I want people to be able to enjoy it and connect with it. But on the other hand, this was a real person. And so like, how do you, how do you make a story interesting, but without sensationalizing an actual person's pain, right? I mean, this is a woman who was sex trafficked, who was um, who, who, you know, endured all sorts of horrible things while working, um, uh, while being in sex work. And so it felt like I, I, in a way, owed something to the person's spirit, if that makes any sense, where, yeah, like, it, it, it was just a very hard line to walk. You know, you um, there are places where, and oh, also at the same time, I didn't want to shy away from the fact that she did a lot of terrible things, right? I think, um, you know, like the results of, look, I enjoyed the Pirates of the Caribbean movies when I was in college, I think is when when they came out, right? But like, I think a result of kind of the Disneyfication of the pirate world is that people think of pirates as these kind of like they're these romantic heroes who just set out on the open seas. It's just they 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 just didn't want anything between them and the ocean. And the fact of the matter is that pirates made their living from killing and robbing and you know what I mean. Like and and I think to uh, neglect the really horrible things that she did um, as a way to. Um, uh, grab and seize power and hold on to power, I think would also be doing a disservice to her victims. You know, like like I I I I didn't want to do a disservice to her, the person, but I also didn't want to do a disservice to the people that she hurt. And so I think all of that had to be a part of the equation for me. And I I sometimes still don't fully know if I made all of the right decisions. Yeah. Well, I think um, what strikes me so much about her character is that she's very complex. You know, she she is violent, but then you also see her capacity for connection and warmth in her female friendships, for example. Um, and I think in that way, you know, every, I don't think there's anyone uh, alive or dead who is just like purely good or bad, right? Um, and I think in that way, you do show that she is a fully dimensional person. Yeah. Or well, that was my my interpretation. Thank you. Thanks for saying that. Um, I mean, I, I, we can keep talking. I want to be mindful of the time. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Any questions? One, two, three. Oh, good. Okay. I'll be Phil Donahue, who has a question. Okay. Thank you very much. I would just wonder about the cover of yeah. the, the deep as the, as the, yeah, as the sky. Um, it, was, it was kind of scary. <laughs> and I almost didn't pick it up, but it was on the 
lucky day book at the library. So I thought, <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> yeah, it was good. But the cover, what's the story behind that? Thank you for trying. Um, yeah, I... So the, the we Bloomsbury got this artist. Um, it's, she's a Japanese American artist who has done you know uh, artwork for like really big people like uh, Neil Gaiman and and several other famous um, famous folks. And um, I think what uh, you know one of the things that they wanted to communicate was that there was something a little bit a force of nature about you know like that it, they didn't want this to be. They wanted it to be a very dynamic cover. I'll I'll put it like that. And I think they're, yeah. I mean, this. If you you're right. If you look at it, you know, the waves. They're not calm waves, right? They're they're very violent, turbulent waves. And then there's a there's a face superimposed on top of it. So I think, um, you know, we were trying to communicate some things about the the fierceness of the world that this particular character lived in, and maybe the fierceness of the character herself yeah but I, I just want to say I do think that um the the artwork is like all of this was this beautiful artwork was um hand I forget the exact hand inked hand stencil like wait so basically she drew every single line by hand and if you um, take a close look at the cover like every single wave is like just perfectly do you want to say a little bit about your cover art um I'm I so we went back and forth. I, I guess I'll just talk about the color of it. Um, we went back and forth uh, about the color. Initially, it was red. And the first version they showed me was red and yellow. And it just kind of, and there was more kind of Second World War imagery. And I was like, we can't do this because this this makes it seem like it's a book about communism. And, you know, given South Korea's history, I was like, that I don't, I don't want people to think that this is a book about North and South Korea. Um, and so we finally arrived uh, on, um, on this cover and this book came out in July um, last year. And I, I felt so lucky because that's when Barbie and Oppenheimer came out. Uh, so I this this book actually got some good window displays because of that sort of pink theme. And so um, I got very lucky there. <laughs> Synchronicity. We love it. Yeah. Yeah, actually, I have two questions. Um, one is how you got the idea of writing about pirates. And secondly, um, I'd like to know more about your research into the stories of the individuals. I mean, did she perhaps keep a journal or, you know, if, if the written history was really about the men, and the oral history was about the women. How did you get hold of the oral history? Um, and you know, was there any other documentation? So um, I grew up in Taiwan, and so there are just kind of stories about her circulate. You know, like people will just sometimes mention her, and you know, but we, we know that she exists. Um, so I remember feeling really captivated by the idea of this character when I was a child, but I, you know, sort of didn't really think I would write a book about it. And then around the time of the 2016 election, um, for those of you know, you, you remember there was a lot of talk about women in leadership positions, and all of a sudden her name started popping up in Western social media. So like I had, I'd only heard about her in the East Asian context. And then all of a sudden I was encountering this name here. And I thought to myself, okay, there's something, there's something in this historical moment, I think that that um, feels right. And also I noticed that a lot of the, the things that people were, the stories that people were telling about her were very, um, dichotomous, they were very black and white. It's either she's like a terrible villain who did all of these terrible things, or, oh, she was this, because she also had made some pretty feminist, um, or what we now would call feminist changes to her to her fleet. And so, and some people were like, oh, she was the kind of feminist icon. And in both cases, they kind of, um, they, they flattened her, right? They made her into like either all good or all bad. And so I thought, okay, well, why don't we, 
write a book about her in which she is both good and bad. And we'll just kind of see how it, how it shakes out. Um, the second part of your question, um, no, I mean, to, to my knowledge, she didn't leave behind any diaries or journals or things like that. It's really most, most of what remains is the stories that people um, tell about her. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I think it was, uh, again, I, I did the best that I could to kind of construct, the, put together the pieces, but I, I make no claims to this being a history book. It's a historical novel. It's fiction, you know. Here's another question. Um, I was wondering, uh, I read a book called The Pirate Queen about the famous uh, pirate of Ireland. Yes. Mally. She was uh, a pirate during the reign of Queen Elizabeth, a revolution show. So this, when I saw this, I think appearing today when I saw pirate is like, oh my goodness, another woman pirate. I guess my question is in all your research, have you found how many female pirates there have been? So I, I can't speak, that's a great question. I can't speak to other parts of the world like Ireland, but there were a surprising number of women pirates in, in this kind of Southeast China area during that time. In fact, there is a rival fleet in um, in uh, this book, and the wife of the commander had a huge played a huge role in in commanding that fleet as well. This was also a real person. Um, she apparently even back she spoke fluent English and was like an expert marksman with like European style firearms. Like nobody really knows like how. Like I think she had some dealings with um, Western traders, and so. Um, yeah, there were a surprising number of, uh, of women on board these ships, and very, um, very often it's because um, so a lot of these people were pirates because um, they were poor. They, they didn't have money. You know, like this was an act of desperation for them, and so when people joined, they brought their entire families on board, which I think is fascinating. So like people raised children and like had their entire families on board these ships because mom and dad, you know, joined the fleet. And so, um, yeah, so I, I mean, I don't, I don't, I can't give you a percentage, but I, I think it was like at least 10% of the, the fleet was like, I know, I know. That's a great question, yeah. I have a question. <laughs> I was so moved by the interspersed sections on Ma Mazu. And then in your acknowledgments, you thank her. Uh, could you talk a little bit about this sea goddess, if you have it right? Yeah, so Mazu is a person that if you grew up in Taiwan, you are there. She is, uh, I think somebody, some people have called her Taiwan's favorite, god, like favorite uh, patron deity. Um, but uh, she is a sea goddess who has her roots in um, in sort of that South South China Sea uh, region, and so when a lot of the the fisher fishermen from South China um, ended up in Taiwan, they brought their worship practices with them. And um, you in Taiwan, you literally cannot walk three steps without encountering some like there's a temple or like they have like little branded cookies with like her her face on it. But um, but but I um, I didn't I I grew up around it, but like as a result of writing this book, I actually became very steeped in the mythology of this particular of this particular goddess. And I thought it was, you know, like if I'm going to write so much about her, I feel like she deserved at least a, a thank you in the acknowledgement section. So um, yeah, so that's that's kind of the short story, short version of the story. Yeah. Where? One of the things I've most enjoyed about the hour we've spent together is listening to the two of you talking to each other. 
you know, the questions you're asking each other, the, the generosity of both of you giving each other a fair amount of time to talk. And it just occurred to me when I think of authors, I think of a real solo world, solo ventures. And I'm wondering as authors, how often do you get the opportunity or do you seek it out when you are writing to get input from another author who has to struggle with questions like, are you being true to the real character? Or are you, what, what's my role? What's my responsibility? And just curious, do you, do you interact with other authors throughout your process or is this real unique here today? I suspect that it's different for different authors. So, you know, I, I, have, I have author friends who say nobody, I don't let anybody read my drafts until I'm completely done, you know, and then like, th then they're allowed to give me feedback. I have author friends who like every time they write a new chapter, they send it on to, you know, their, their writer friends to say like, what do you think? Do I need to change anything? So I personally am a, I like to finish the first draft by myself first, because the first draft is so kind of like, kind of chaotic and kind of ne nebulous, you know, to begin with that like, I, I, I don't want too much outside input. And then after the first draft is completed, then I'm like begging, I'm like, you know, like you know, sending the manuscript to like as many people as I, I, that I trust as I can and saying like, would you mind giving your eyes to this and and, and seeing how, what you're thinking. I, I am curious what your process is like. Yeah, I'm, I'm similar in that I don't like to share really early work. Um, there, it's just way too vulnerable. And I think, you know, asking for feedback too early can kind of cloud your vision of like what you're trying to do, because you're still working it out, I think, in the, the first draft. So I, I'm in agreement with you there. And, you know, I, I, for a long time, I was part of a writing group with other writers and we would exchange scenes. And what I discovered was that, yes, it was wonderful to have the feedback of other writers on, on what I was writing, but I actually benefited more in looking at other people's work closely and thinking about like, oh, you know, how, you know, cause then you're really in a, a sort of more editorial frame of mind. You're like, why is this so successful? Why is this not working? Like, how can we make this better? And then just like, uh, then reorienting that critical lens back in, on my work. And then that really helped, um, I think. And, and I would also say, I think there are a lot of solo writers out there who, who don't want to be in community, but I think it's essential and there's nothing I love more than geeking out about craft, which is a very specific type of conversation um, with other writers. So. And I just will say, if there are any writers here, I do encourage you, like, you know, whether you decide to stay in them or not, that's up to you. But I do encourage if you haven't already to check out local writing communities, um, whether it's like writing groups or like in San Francisco, there's this thing called the Writer's Grotto that I belong to for many years. Um, but it, writing is a very lonely path sometimes, right? And um and even if you're not sharing your work with other people, I think there's some benefit to just being in the presence of other people who are also doing this very kind of, um, difficult, sometimes underappreciated work. So fi find your local communities. As well. Yeah, and I think finding writers who have a similar level of commitment, I think is important. Um, uh, I think that was what I loved about the masters that I did. Um, everyone up until that point, I was doing sort of uh, weekly classes where you know people were just experimenting. But then um, my masters was really focused on getting to that finish line of com completing a full draft, and we were all sort of in it together. Mm -hmm. And that was well. Before we say thank you, um, I w as com has this wonderful tradition of giving away copies. Of, of the book and um i wondered if anyone is celebrating a birthday in april <laughs> no one okay how about is anyone about to celebrate a birthday in may okay uh -huh. that, um maybe bethany can you help me pass these out um bethany is another librarian congratulations may and was anyone celebrating a birthday in 
Did you raise your hand back there too? Anyone celebrating a birthday last month in March? Okay. <laughs> okay. And there you go. All right. And um, can we give a big round of applause to Hannah and Rita? Thank you. Please buy a copy of the book if you're interested. Both books are for sale back there with Zach, and we hope you'll stay and have some refreshments. Thank you very much, Thank everyone. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Oh, right <laughs> here. I'm sure they'd be happy to sign. I'm sure. Yes, absolutely.